Titus remained motionless amidst the dense undergrowth of the jungle, much like a silent sentinel of the Emperor's will. He felt a brief satisfaction as he observed the Imperial Guard soldiers mirroring his stoic stillness. With a nod of approval shared among his remaining battle brothers, Titus redirected his unwavering gaze toward the mission's objective. This marked the sixth week of their deployment, and Titus adjusted his position by a neighboring tree, assessing the soldiers' placements around him. He let out a slow exhale, casting another observant glance in his surroundings. Above him, despite the prevailing humidity and water-laden vegetation, the sky was clear, devoid of clouds and rain. The stars gleamed brightly, accompanied by the two discernible moons orbiting the forsaken planet in the Segmentum Ultima sector. The mission briefing had disclosed eight moons, but only two were visible to the naked eye. It was a primordial world with no intelligent life, yet its subterranean resources held value for the Imperium. The planet needed to be secured. Bombarding the enemy from orbit was not an option. The mission demanded a ground approach. Since the beginning of the Great Crusade, every planet, regardless of size, was to be brought under the Emperor's rule, especially those vital to the war effort. Repositioning himself for better defense, Titus reminisced about the mission's initial days. The Imperial Guard had been dispatched to assess the threat level and secure the planet if necessary. This was a routine practice for smaller celestial bodies where the Emperor's legions were not required at the forefront. The arrival of the Blood Angels to assist in this situation, the Imperial Guard was surprising but not unheard of. Astartes often joined battles when the Astra Militarum were unable to achieve their objectives. Titus and his battle brothers descended in drop pods, creating shock waves as they landed between the remaining Imperial Guard and the enemy. Exiting their pods, the Space Marines unleashed a barrage of gunfire, swiftly annihilating most of the foes, while the rest of them scattered into the surrounding woods. With the area secured, the six Astartes executed a precise plan. Three positioned themselves at each potential entry point on the plateau, while the remaining trio advanced together toward the highest ledge of the ruined structure. Approaching the balcony's edge, the Imperial Guard soldiers knelt in reverence and respect, whispering praises, his angels and the Emperor's angels. Titus and his brethren paid no heed to the kneeling men, focused on the ruined balcony above the lush vegetation. Removing his helmet, Titus revealed a cold, squared face, short-cut hair, and a piercing gaze. Surveying the scene, he turned to the still kneeling soldiers. Most kept their heads bowed, but a few dared to meet his gaze. Approaching an identified sergeant, Titus commanded in a stern tone, Report! The kneeling soldier remained transfixed, gazing up at the towering space marine with a mix of reverence and awe. Titus repeated, this time his tone was sharper and more commanding. Sergeant, report! The sergeant, still in awe of the towering space marine, quickly gathered himself and reported with military precision. Sergeant Alaric from the Crimson Serpents, 47th Company of the 8th Vossen Rifles Regiment. We were sent to secure the planet for Imperium resources. Two days after landing, unknown enemies struck under the cover of darkness, eliminating Sentinels and the entire general staff. As a junior sergeant, I was on patrol. Upon my return, I reinforced the defenses and called for backup. Communication interference in the planet's ionosphere forced us to relocate for a clearer signal. Once we sent the distress signal, we were attacked by these screaming terrors. We held our ground until your arrival in drop pods. Titus released a slow breath, leaning against the gnarled trunk of a tree, his gaze fixed upon the imposing hill ahead. Space Marines, towering at an average height of seven feet, roughly 213 meters, were the epitome of superhuman prowess. Titus, clad in his battle armor, together with his battle brothers, always stood as a formidable force on the battlefield. Enhanced by gene seed implants that granted them superhuman ability, and paired with psycho indoctrination and advanced battle gear, they embodied a lethal killing machine, capable of annihilating any adversary in direct combat. 
and that was the main problem Titus was confronting with. In the first days of the battle, they have obliterated the enemy in every single fight, but after that the enemy changed tactics. Within the narrow pathways of the jungle, the tall and full-bodied space marines were at a disadvantage. On full head-on conflicts, they could obliterate enemies twice or three times their numbers without breaking a sweat. But in a guerrilla warfare type of situation, where the enemy was quick, swift, deadly, and silent, the imposing space marines found themselves at an advantage. And this was that exact type of situation, as Titus quickly thought in the beginning, after the first skirmishes. A seizing the enemy, he suspected the presence of Eldar howling banshees, perhaps a scouting party. Seizing command of the remaining Imperial Guard, he pressed forward in the Emperor's name to quickly destroy their enemies. Judging by the number of losses they have experienced within the past weeks, this proved to have been a strategic mistake. In the past weeks, the enemy has harassed and attacked them constantly. The Eldar warriors had the uncanny ability to walk silently within the jungle, often not even disturbing the wild animals. The Astartes, with their enhanced sense, would often sense their approach and would place everyone on guard about the upcoming attack. Yet the Banshee's multi-directional strikes more often than not resulted in devastating losses on both sides. After losing a battle brother and half the Imperial Guard, Titus recognized the gravity of the situation. This was not a mere scout party, but a formidable strike force with abundant resources. Drawing another breath, Titus consulted his knowledge on the Eldari race. The Howling Banshees embody the swift and deadly aspects of Eldar warfare, excelling in hit-and-run tactics and close-quarters combat. He maintained vigilant focus on the target before him, recalling the knowledge assimilated and aspirant during his training. Howling Banshees wield a shuriken pistol and an Eldari power sword, capable of cutting through the toughest armor. Skilled use of their pistol eliminates vulnerable targets while their blade dispatches heavily armored foes like space marines. However, Titus and his team were not only dealing with Howling Banshees on this planet, at times during the battle, he noticed rapid movements of the Eldari Warp Spiders. These are Aspect Warriors, which specialize in the use of a personal teleportation device built into their armor to make a series of rapid jumps through the Immaterium that make them nearly impossible to target and allow them to attack the enemy suddenly and disappear before you can strike back. Targeting and killing them is difficult even for an Astartes soldiers, but was not impossible as estimating the exit point of their teleport could be easily calculated. The good news here was that there could not be more than two such warp spiders within the current enemy forces. The fight was long and exhausting. This was a swift and lethal foe. They were constantly striking from the shadows and then disappearing only to reappear elsewhere, like a dance of cunning and deadly precision. During the chaos which ensured, most of them got separated. As they neared their vital objective, Titus realized that they were facing a tactical challenge with no intel on what to expect at their destination. Therefore, he carefully directed his remaining battle brothers to an elevated vantage point. With a stern command, he urged them to prepare for a coordinated strike upon the designated target upon his signal. The rest of the Imperial Guard formed a protective ring around Titus. Minutes of ferocious combat passed, and then, as swiftly as they had come, the enemy attacks slowly diminished until they eventually stopped. Titus concluded that either all enemies have been eradicated, or they had dealt enough damage to force them to retreat. Seizing the respite, he allowed his forces a moment of reprieve before the impending final assault. The Eldari Witch, as well as any remaining enemy forces, had to be eliminated. The planet had to be cleansed by the impure alien forces in the name of the Emperor. After several minutes of rest, he signaled his remaining forces to move out, while at the same time, communicating through their internal network, he instructed his battle brothers to prepare for engagement. Silently and unnoticed, they traversed through the underbrush, closing in on the edge of a clearing. 
In the midst of the meadow, a small Eldari contingent, consisting of howling banshees, a lone warp spider, and the Eldar Farseer, encircled a fallen space marine which was lying on the ground. More of us are coming. This planet will be ours. You lost this war before you started, fool. <laughs> Titus gazed skyward as the stars gradually dimmed. A growing swarm of creatures swiftly obscured the heavens, their ominous growls intensifying in the surrounding darkness. Standing tall over the lifeless form of the Eldar Witch, Titus observed the emergence of this new threat that loomed overhead. Amidst the clamor of approaching creatures, a sliver of doubt crept into his unwavering faith. As a space marine, his singular goal echoed with the imperatives of duty. Burn the heretic, kill the mutant, purge the unclean, all in the hallowed name of the God Emperor. Yet a small feeling of uncertainty seized him. Amidst the clamor of approaching creatures, a sliver of doubt crept into his unwavering faith. As a space marine, his singular goal echoed with the imperatives of duty. Burn the heretic, kill the mutant, Purge the unclean, all in the hallowed name of the God Emperor. Yet a small feeling of uncertainty seized him. What if this unclean Eldar witch was trying to thwart an even greater menace? Titus cast a final glance at the fallen body below, contemplating the weight of this newfound revelation. Was he, in questioning, turning towards heresy? Had the hypno-indoctrination failed in his case? Or was he, in fact, a true son of Sanguinius, destined for a more profound truth? In those fleeting moments, it felt as if Titus had traversed a myriad of existences. The newly anointed blood angel sensed an inner fire kindling within, baptized in both literal fire and blood. Witnessing his brethren's fall, he discovered a deeper purpose that resonated with the echoes of a thousand lives lived in a mere heartbeat. For the blood angels, for Sanguinium, for the Emperor. The cries were all around him and he joined in. Titus exhaled after the resounding battle cry only to be met with the looming figure of a creature, its fangs ominously poised over him. A thousand thoughts ran around his mind as his hand was firmly gripping his sword, his enhanced muscles already prepared to strike. He turned with a swift and decisive strike, only to encounter unexpected resistance from the enormous shadowing figure above him.